hello and welcome to Phoenix Books in Burlington. Um, tonight I have the honor of getting to introduce someone who has written a book that I absolutely loved when I was reading it yesterday. Um, I don't usually read books that I end up reading in one sitting, and this one I just couldn't put down. Um, it's really something very special about a topic that is very hard to talk about. Um, and it's, it's beautifully written, it's in, pro, or it's in verse, um, which makes it something even more unique, uh, that it can talk about something that's so difficult and be so beautiful at the same time. So um, Dana Walrath is here with us tonight, and she is someone who has done many things. <laughs> um, but this, uh, I think, is something that I, I hope she is very proud of, because she should be. Um, but yeah, so I'm gonna, let you guys get to experience Dana. Thank you. So thank you all for coming out. And thank you for Phoenix Books for hosting us. And thank you especially to my dear husband, Peter Bingham, and my dear friend, Jeff Davis, for providing some music. Um, our oldest one once asked me if our uh, music was our religion. Uh, so, um, and this story that I'm going to read from also began with a question. My mother's parents are both survivors of the Armenian Genocide of 1915. And when I was around eight or nine years old, I asked her, you know, so, so uh, what happened? What was it like? How'd she get here? And my mother said, very deadpan, matter of fact, after her parents were killed, then she and her younger brother uh, and sister hid during the day and ran at night from their home in Palu, which is now in eastern Turkey, to Aleppo, Syria, hundreds of miles. Uh, and, um, and that's a place that now is still surrounded, filled with conflict, um, so dear to my heart. This um, story haunted me. I wasn't a writer at eight or nine. I didn't figure that out until much more recently. Um, and, uh, and somehow this story was a, a, a chance to make sense of that little bit that I had heard from my mother. It's told in a series of dramatic monologues. So first person narratives, there are four narrators. Uh, the first one of them is Arziv. That's the Armenian word for eagle. Um, and this narrator is an eagle. And there are then three siblings, um, fraternal twins, Shahen and Sosi, and then their younger sister, Mariam, who's about five years old. Um, and Sosi and Shahen are just on the cusp of adulthood. And the only other thing you know is that a, need to know is that a drum cap is um, a fez, a, um, which is a, a hat kind of like this. This is as close to a fez as I had in my house, but you get the idea, a, a, a hat made like this. Um, so like water on stone. One, Palu, 1914, Arziv. Three young ones, one black pot, a single quill and a tuft of red wool are enough to start a new life in a new land. I know this is true because I saw it. We track our quills when they fall, always. With eagle eyes we can see from the sky who picks one up from the ground or rescues it from the crook of a branch, the quill's mottled color blending in with peeling bark. It was the girl who picked up my quill. She and her mother worked side by side, plucking frothy white beetle bodies from leaf and stalk. They crushed them between their fingertips and used this insect blood to turn their carpet fibers, the richest red. Clever. When my feather dropped, the girl, the older one, Sosi, almost full grown, her body budding, stirred from her work. The little one, Mariam, napped on a carpet beside her. Sosi, named for plane trees that stand tall on this land. Her short, quick inhale as she saw it tug the air around me. She wiped her red-tipped fingers on her apron before reaching up. Look, Mama, a new misrab for Papa. A nine-beat song pulsed through my wings. A musician? What luck. If my quill could pull laments from the strings of an oud, I thought then my heart might heal. That quill is for your brother, the mother said. It's time that Shahen learned to play. 
a young musician? More luck. Far beyond this beetled field, where river cut through mountain, a curly-headed, big-eyed boy shivered when she spoke. Shahen, suns here as eagles see. Fast green water flowed along the distant bank. An arc of giant stones rose from the riverbed, bending the current's forward force. Water seeped back behind these stones, forming a still pool for Shahen, his face reflected in the water, so delicate like Sosi's. His thumb and fingers curled round a flat, smooth stone. He bent his hand tight toward his arm. One fierce flick of his wrist sent the stone to water. It skipped nine times, like the beat of a song. Ripples spread through the top of the pool, then sank into its surface, then to no one. To the air, perhaps to me, Shahen said, no one plays oud in America. My musician, what luck. Shahen, come on, lucky stone, give me seven, not nine, not eight, one for each of them, none for me. Papa, Mama, Kevor, Misak, Anahit, Sosi, Mariam, me. Eight, it can't be eight, not the, not the eight arches of the Palu Bridge. I can't be stuck here with a fool for a father and a land ruled by Muslims, priests just bah like sheep. My fate isn't here, sitting in church, learning of what was, not of what could be. My fate isn't here, grinding wheat into flour. That's enough for my brothers, big dolts with no dreams. Come on, Stone, you're the lucky one. Papa, Mama, Kevor, Misa, Ganihit, Sosi, Mariam, me. Pah, stupid, eight, stupid like Papa, who keeps his head in song. If he stopped playing the oud, if he looked instead of listened, if he stopped thinking we're all the same, that Christians like us could ever be free, deep inside an empire ruled by Muslim, Ottoman Turks, they have no place for us, not in their hearts. Papa should know this. He was alive in 1895 when Sultan Hamid first gave the orders to kill us, not me. He knows we pay double taxes and cannot vote. If he opened his eyes, if he stopped thinking of the world as a song with disparate parts always blending, he would know that my Keri, my uncle, is right. All the way from New York, Mama's brother knows the truth. We should marry our own. If I go to New York to live with my Keri, my face will be bristled at last. No longer the little one, the little brother twin to a girl with a fool for a father. There, I'll grow tall. The bristles will come. I'll live in a tower that touches the sky. Come on, pink stone, perfect, smooth, and flat. Cut me out, make it seven. Stone spins and cuts the surface. Papa big spray, Mama less, Kevor closer, Misak smaller, Anahit Sosi Mariam. Stone sinks into water. I will do it with care. As the proverb says, measure seven times, cut once. That's how I will do it. I'm going to America. Mariam, feet up, feet down, heels hit house. Feet up, feet down. Shahen, come home. It's time to play the bird game. Time to play the bird game. Feet up, feet down. I sit, I wait. Feet up, feet down. He's here. Shahen's on the ground, his arms spread wide. Time to play the bird game? Yes, he tells me. He always says yes. My wings pull back. Meg, yergu, yerek. One, two, three, flap, flap, flap. I fly. My heart goes first down, down from the roof into Shahen's arms. He catches me. He holds me high. He spins me round and round like the mill wheel. I fly above. I am his little dove. Sosi. Mama teaches me how to bargain for fabrics. First fingertips feel texture and weight, face and voice silent. Never take first price. See what Turks have to offer, but buy Armenian cloth if you can. Never show which one you love. 
Go to see each merchant's wares, compare and think and breathe in spices, hot bite of cayenne, fenugreek for basturma, warm, strong taste of earthy cumin, deep red paprika to make a paste, crisp allspice for monte stuffing, mahalaps bitter almond nip. We buy a bolt of woven wool, tight with pattern and warmth. Mama says the silks I love will wait till I'm a wife. Silks instead of mama, silks instead of home. Fatima Bey Injili comes to the stall behind us. Special price for you today, Gavur, infidel, as though you need it already with all the best land. Mama places the bolt between them. Her left hip juts out like a ledge. She stares straight ahead, lips sealed. The Turk from the shop says to Fatima, the Gavur are clever with their money, as he drops a coin into Mama's open palm. Teşekkür ederim, Mama thanks him, nose up, lips drawn tight like a hard wrinkled pit. I can buy my cloth from others if you like. The Turk bows his bald head low, the fringe of hair around his crown, like an upside down bristle black smile. No, Madame, you must come again. With your lovely daughter, the bolt and the price pleased us both. Good day then, Mama said, pulling me from the stall, past the other bet vendors, past the crowd, over the bridge, squeezing my hand, muttering, the pea gets honey from the same flower where the snake sucks her poison. She lets go, only when we reach our orchard, spread along the river's edge. I said nothing to that snake, only because your father holds her husband Mustafa dear. As if I didn't have enough to worry me with you making eyes at clockmaker's sons before fathers have even spoken. And Shahan, wet from the river? He played with Turkish boys again, you know. The pair of you will be my end. And the nerve of that vendor insulting us as we give him good money. Sosi, look around you. This is Armenia. Fat Turks from Constantinople rule for miles and miles. But these are our lands. Your father planted these very vines with cutting from my father's arbors. His grandfather's grandfather planted the olives, his father the apricots. Nothing came free. Not the millstones, not the earth, not the sheep, not the wheat. Generations of sweat, don't you ever forget. Grapevines heavy with fruit bend over straight wood frames. Silver olive leaves shimmer behind them. Apricots blush in the sun. So now you know the four characters. And I want to close with two readings from Ardziv, who came in there um, uh, to give a bigger a moral conscience, I guess. Ardziv, I circled above, watching Shahen swim in the river with the young drum caps. That's when I saw him that boy, the drum cap with the toothy grin. He was with the man with the red drum cap and the stiff white beard, trimmed and combed and polished so it spread out and down like the feathers of a tail. That man shot my mate. That man clapped the boy on the shoulders where wings would have sprouted were he a bird. For 40 days, my mate had stayed there on the nest till this brood had hatched. Three eggs this time, with me bringing all the food and fresh pine sprigs. One by one, the young emerged in the order they were laid, their egg tooth breaking through the shell, their eyes partway closed. No true feathers, just gray, white, down, and open mouths, open shut, open shut. She would never leave them in those early days. It takes two full weeks for eaglets to be able to hold their heads up, for feeding, open mouths, open shut, open shut. She was bigger, swifter, as are all females of our kind, but I was good for my size. That year I brought so much food, no chick would need to eat the other, so ample were my hunts. Young rabbit, marmot, skunk, which she shredded and fed into their open mouths, open shut, open shut. But eagles suffer when they cannot fly. As the young grew strong and their wings expanded and black tip feathers replaced their down, the young one's appetites peaked. It was time for her to fly again. I pushed her from the nest as I had done before. She flew straight into a bullet. Arziv, 
Green mountain fields turned into gold as wheat grass curled and ripened. Harvest songs rose from the fields as sickles slashed the stalks. One August dusk, as the sun hung low and colors filled the sky, Mama and Sosie spread a rich red cloth across the roof floor with pad platters of food upon the cloth. Mariam flapped. Shahan carried Mariam on his shoulders, holding her round knees as he darted down the path to greet the guests. Mariam flapped her arms above him like a baby bird, unbending her knees and rising at the sight of Anahid, who quickened her step when she saw him. I flew in quite close, not believing my eyes at the sight of her husband and her, his parents behind her. They wore headscarves and prayer shawls. This was a family of Kurds. Kurds who pray with the drum caps, bowing south five times each day. Young Asan, the husband of Anahid and his parents, Kaban and Palewan. Such hugging and laughter up on the roof, sharing the meal like one family. Imagine, Kurds and Armenians together as if falcons and eagles had just become one. Last light faded from the sky as they ate, but surprises did not end. Another lone man came up the path with a curious, slanted walk. He pressed and pushed to arrive, leading with his heart a dumbek drum, its sides inlaid with mother of pearl, held tight against his body. His arms squeezed the drum's waist, the goatskin taut across its top, but something pulled him from the back of his legs as he moved forward. A round drum cap on his head said, no mistaking it, this Mustafa was a Turk. Imagine, like falcons and hawks right inside my nest. I mean, it was one of them, a falcon or a hawk, it had to have been who came to my nest after the drum cap shot my mate. Tucked into a rock, high on a ledge, the nest could be reached only by one with wings. I'd left them alone, the young ones. I had no choice. Their mouths were always open, open shut, open shut. Their flight feathers were not yet full. I had waited in the nest till I spied a plump gray rabbit. Within minutes I was back, my beak full of flesh for them. But the nest was already empty. Hidden by night now, I dropped down to low branches as the music began, soothing music, music soothing my sore heart. My quill plucked sweet sounds from the strings of the oud, drawing me in, shahen too. Mustafa's steady hand beat his dumbek. Kaban's cheeks emptied then filled, the duduk sound unceasing with his constant breath. Lydian melodies like oil flowed, mother tongues in unison blending, thick umber of Turkish coffee, Armenian apricots ginger ripe, blue Kurdish moonlight above us. Misak and Kevorg stood, arms out, hands on shoulders, catching the beat of their song, the Tamzara with their step. One, two, three, stomp, stomp. One, two, three, stomp, stomp. Asan joined the line, now an arc, Mama and Palawan between them. One, two, three, stomp, stomp. Shahan did not dance. He had eyes only for my quill. His lips turned up as Papa pulled my quill across the string. But as the song ended, Papa Shahen jumped up too. Sosi too, they pulled Anahid to her feet to make her dance. With Asan next, the young couple wound around each other like eagles courting, though one of them had falcon blood, talons locked, cartwheeling through the sky, the line between their eyes never breaking. The melody of the slow, sweet song twisted and turned around itself, our eyes all on them. Mustafa, tender and sweet, Kaban and Papa, proud, Misak and Kevorg dreaming. Mothers blushed, children shushed. Sounds of the stream on the stone and the wood filled the air till Papa rose to stand, his hand across his heart. My wife's brother is a faraway fool to hold back his blessing for Anahid and Asan. Here it's clear. You men are my brothers. Our holy books differ by one prophet only. The sun does not shine on one man and his family, keeping others in the dark, even in New York. When falcons or hawks came to my nest, I must confess, I sang a different song. Thank you.
I'd love to answer any questions you might have, because that's kind of the fun part. <laughs> <laughs> Did your stay in Armenia uh, give birth to this book, or is it before that even? It's before that, but my stay in Armenia absolutely informed it. I sold the book the October of the year I was there, or, um, and so I went through the final phases of revision um, with my editor while I was living in Armenia. And so threads that were already present became really enriched. Um, there was already a, a music thread, obviously, and there was a bit of a dancing thread, but we were folk dancing twice a week, and so these other dances made it in, some of them very overtly. There's a, a scene where Shahen's running, and this, my very, very favorite dance, which is called the Alashkerdi Kochari, where you, you're, you're um, it's a, uh, supposed to be a men's dance, but nowadays everyone does it. You're really tightly linked, and you are doing these intricate steps, and the tempo gets faster and faster, and so it's like you're flying. So that's, dance is literally there. And then um, there was another dance that I loved um, called Madzun, which is the Armenian word for yogurt. And, um, and we um, uh, made yogurt as a kid with my mom sometimes, and you have to stir the milk. And when you do this dance, there's all these movements like this to stir, stir the madzun. And though then suddenly from doing that dance regularly, these new scenes with making yogurt appeared in the book. So it just was constantly um, bringing stuff in. I also had the advantage of being able to go over to the Armenian Genocide Museum and Institute and access a whole bunch of primary sources. So I had um, one fact check thing that I had to do a big shift. I had always heard this one story from my mother about the orphanage. Um, and um, so, but I didn't know any of the details, and while I was there, I learned that by 1916, um, the Ottoman government had closed all the orphanages, um, and they, uh, the very young children were assimilated into Turkey, and then the older children were marched out into the desert. And, um, and so, uh, except for the older children that got taken in by, um, by local families and hid them. And so I had to change what the, the, the whole ending <laughs> in order to accommodate that truth, because I, I, there's, there's space for um, uh, um, omniscient eagles, but there's not space for wrong facts in historical fiction. <laughs> so, <laughs> Cheryl. Dana, I was wondering about the land itself when you were there. Did you travel over land some of the route, or how did the land influence your writing? Oh, such a good question. Where I was was Eastern Armenia. Where the book is set is Western Armenia. And I, Peter and I, had been there in 1984. And that was a time that Armenians never traveled in Turkey. Um, there were um, uh, anti-Armenian stories in the newspaper every day. It's changed now, um, and, and Armenians can go go there. But we went, we pretended we were just a nice young American couple, and, and we'd sit down and get fed delicious food that I had eaten all my life. And people would say, oh, I bet you never had anything like this before. And I'd say, no, that's delicious, and so <laughs> forth. <laughs> and, um, but when we got to, to Palu, um, I knew my mother's, um, my grandmother's family were millers, so we asked the local people, are there any mills, are there any mills? So we actually got directed to a mill that we had to cross that bridge with um, a new bridge next to the old bridge with the eight arches and found our way through the woods up to a mill and that's what I used for the setting of the book. So though I didn't make the whole mountain trek, I knew Palu from being there in 1984. So, yeah. And I had no idea I was doing research for a book <laughs> at that point whatsoever. Um, there was a question over here someplace. Maybe I answered it because I. Mm, Charlie. Dana, are, I, I mean, are there still survivors uh, in, in Armenia that, that are conversant and. and, uh, and are they? Yeah, there, there are the people who were alive in 1915. There's only a very, very tiny handful. There's several groups of survivors. Um, there are there's a whole group of people called the Hamshahai who um, converted to to um, Islam and are um, live in sort of the north uh, eastern. 
northwestern, sorry, northwestern corner of uh, along the Black Sea. Um, then there are a lot of people who were hidden, um, as in um, Fethiye Chetan's memoir about her grandmother. Um, so there are many, many people that kind of uh, survived but kept their identity a secret. And now, because of the changing politics, they're coming out. Um, uh, I, uh, there's one Turkish scholar, Umit um, Uzgur, who got into genocide studies because he was watching a show on TV and hi with his grandmother when he came home from college. And um, his grandmother, it was you know sort of saying what didn't really happen. And his grandmother turned to him and said, that's a bunch of lies. Here's what my parents told me. So it's a really hopeful time because these stories are coming out. And what um, Ungur has done is he started kind of a, 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 um, a video project to capture all of these stories and just get them on um, onto the internet. So there's no way to kind of deny those truths from another angle because it's always been Armenians saying that it happened and then the wall, the official policy of denial. So this is a very interesting grassroots movement coming from, from within Turkey. Oh, Jim. How did you come to verse as a way of expressing this? Can you talk a bit about that? Was it a journey or? It, I um, was poetry phobic most of my life um, and only recently came to loving poetry. And this came out that way, and I think not, I, I, um, not because I intended for it to come out that way, but because the topic is so difficult. And um, if you tell the story in stylish and beautiful language, you can talk about some horrendous things without your reader having to just like put it away and never go back to it. So the white space on the page made it safe for me and for the reader. And so that is, that is how it happened. And so I didn't start out intending to write it in verse. It, it, it kind of just happened. <sighs> so. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Mm -hmm. You tell the story so beautifully. Do you ever think about doing an audio version with the music too? <laughs> 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 That's really, it's, it's uh, people, I have a pet peeve when authors shouldn't be reading their own works. There are a lot of them that do it and, and don't do it well. Um, but I've heard that before, and um, I, I know that I won't listen to something if it isn't read well. So, so um, <laughs> yeah, that's a, um, they're, they're actually, in Armenia, there's this wonderful um, center for technology called uh, TUMO, which um, was set up by American Armenians to bring cutting edge technology to the youth of Armenia. And the project that they're doing there to commemorate the genocide is an animation of like water on stone and so i actually have already recorded it <laughs> for them so and 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 it's really just great to hear that there's room full, filled of students who are working on their drawings and they're just listening to to me tell the story and yeah, and the and this is even the sweetest thing about it is that the young woman who's leading it is a cousin of mine. So um, it came at, um, at the time of the genocide, there was an oldest brother who made it over to um, uh, uh, Eastern Armenia, what's now the Republic of Armenia. And then all of the rest of them um, made it over to um, France and then to the United States via Syria, some of them, others, other routes. And, um, uh, and actually, some of them stayed behind. That was that was to your question, Charlie. I have I have a, um, a Turk, uh, Turkish Kurdish Armenian cousin in in Antalya. <laughs> so, um, uh, but um, she and I connected when I was back in Armenia last fall, and. Um, I, I kind of like to razz about genetics and say it's overdone, but my gosh, when I met this young woman, it was like meeting, we have the exact same body language, and it was just uncanny, but she's the one who's leading the project. And, um, and, uh, and uh, Trosha Girian is the family name, um, and, um, and uh, 
it's just it's a sweet happening. <laughs> Lisa, can you talk a little bit about you know, where your grandparents went and came to? My um, grandfather, who's from Vaughan, the story with him was he was an adult. He already had a wife and children that were killed. And then the heroic story was that he killed some Turkish soldiers with his bare hands so his seven sisters could get across the border. I don't know how much of that is true. I do know that his father was a priest in Constantinople, today's Istanbul, and that he made it out via Constantinople. And then um, my a fact that I learned about him um, during my mother's dementia, she kept this quiet until um, because she wanted us to all be on an upwardly mobile trajectory, I think. Uh, but apparently, when he first arrived, he worked at the Ford Motor um, Company factories in Detroit. So, um, so that was uh, what I know about him. Then he and my grandmother um, had an arranged marriage. And um, she came first from Aleppo, then to Marseille, and then to New York. With um, And already, there was an uncle, a caddy, in New York. And so that part of the story was real. That uncle. Um, I guess had gone to France. He had even worked in the French. Uh, in uh, he was a soldier for the French, uh, the Le uh, uh, the Foreign Legion, and then um, uh, and so he was the one that managed to get the younger siblings over eventually. So, but I know almost nothing more than that. That's because everyone died, and they kept they they didn't talk about the the pain. Um, so, so that was why I had to m figure out a way to write about it, to fill in gaps. So, Dan. There's so much love and loveliness in the writing and in the project, and the, both this and Alzheimer's. Uh, but you're in both books writing about fairly difficult content. Can you talk about? I don't know. Is it is balancing the metaphor or interweaving? I mean, you're because you, you know it's so light and gorgeous at the same time that it's I th very that's hard. Such a such a good question. For me, writing is essentially processing anything that hurts, and and it's it's like it's like it's alchemy or something. So that you take something that's that's just horrible, and then by working with it, you transform it into something that's um, that can speak to others. So you kind of, I mean, I guess it's the ultimate recycling, you know, really making something good out of something bad. Um, but that for me, I know that when I'm not writing, when I'm not doing creative work, I start just not being a happy person. And when I'm managing to do that work, I, am able to say, oh my gosh, look at that flower. I mean, I'm just in a space that can, um, can appreciate the, the beauty. I think you need to have the, a, a real engagement with the horrible things in order to really appreciate the joys. So that's, I think, the balance. Oh. Thank and you. And so was there closure for you? For me? Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. Both the Alzheimer's and the... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Though I have to say with both projects, I feel like there's more work to do. I mean, I've got to sit down and write a grant to get this translated into Turkish and Armenian and to figure out more talking to each other. I mean, I, I have a whole sort of... Uh, uh, human, uh, human rights agenda that I'd love this to be able to contribute to. So I think to, to um, and I had some opportunities to do a little bit of that already. I was um, down um, at, at Clark University speaking with Taner Akcam, who's the first Turkish scholar to uh, recognized the genocide. He ended up um, uh, being jailed and being exiled, but now he's the um, a very important part of the genocide and Holocaust studies at Clark. And I was talking to him about the relationship between fiction and and um, and the work he does, and he said, "We're the ones back in the kitchen, but you guys are the ones that bring it out to to people." And it, it just it's it's really a, a lovely thing. And again, um, just this person who is absolutely um, knows what's right and knows how to get the right things out into the world. Um, I sort of was asking him for advice on how to field, because you know there have been people who've been assassinated and different things like that within even very recent times. Um, Rant Dink, a journalist in Istanbul, um, for one. And so I've been thinking how to 
say what I believe and then not be at danger. And his Tanarakjam's advice was um, just always, just always, uh, just always say the truth, and then it, you don't have to worry about anything. Just. <laughs> 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 was there a struggle did, did you have to wrestle with a desire to say you bastards how could you do this you bastards that's really such a good question no because I'm I grew up as an American and I know I guess when we were in Vaughn um, I remember f picking up hostility in the streets, and those were moments in, back in 1984 that I felt that. It was kind of like, I can't believe that this is getting denied, or I'd see an Armenian church completely defaced, or I'd see frescoes with all the faces peeled off, and, and, and so forth. So I did have moments like that. I, I take it back. But most of the time, um, what happens for me is that I... Um, I am just figuring out how to reach who can be reached, and I take what I learned growing up in this culture, and, um, and um, I mean, I grew up in the civil rights movement, and so I really have this uh, mindset that people are people are people. So I get very uncomfortable when um, nationalism turns to bigotry, even when it's my own people. So I really um, work very hard to make it possible to have conversations with uh, people on all sides so that we can cross boundaries. I mean, th that to me is, is the most important thing any of us can do. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh. Oh. Any other questions? We I was just wondering what it's like now in Armenia, like if, you know, it's safe to travel. Oh gosh, it's in Armenia proper, the Republic of Armenia, it's a wonderful place to go as a tourist. It's really, really, really fun. And I've never felt so safe in a city of a million something people in my whole life. I grew up in New York and, and I'm used to knowing how to lock things up. And I um, always had a ritual that when I went to the Genocide Museum, I would walk there. Kind of it was a way to honor all of the marching that Armenians did out into the desert. And I kept on seeing that there was this gorgeous park and I would want to walk through the park. And then finally I, I figured out, okay, I can do that and then I can cross that bridge. And the very first time I went into the park, I'm walking along and I realized, wow, there's a guy behind me and there's another guy in front of me and he bent down and picked up a metal rod and I thought, oh, Dana, you blew it. And then I remembered, oh, I'm in Armenia. He's just collecting scrap metal. I mean, so it really is, <laughs> it's really, really very safe in that regard. It's not safe in the sense though that now there's a military buildup of, um, from Azerbaijan threatening Armenia and um, because of the independence of a, uh, an Armenian um, region that was put in Azerbaijan by Stalin. So, I mean, that whole region, the whole Middle East, Caucasus, Central Asia, is just still reeling from the legacy of colonialism and, and Stalinism in, in Central Asia. And so there were, um, so that's a conflict that does make it dangerous. Um, right in the border areas especially, but, but in terms of going and getting to experience the culture, it's really quite lovely. And, um, and I'm dying to go back to Western Armenia, Eastern Turkey, and, and hope to do it next year. So, oh. great. Well, so I think we have time for one more question, if anyone else has anything they want to ask us. Great. Well, thank you, Dana. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. <laughs> thank you.